Hey guys, welcome back to another video, Seven Stop here. And today I'm gonna to be interviewing my friend, George in Korea. Um, he learned Korean using the all Korean all the time method. Um, and so today I'm gonna to be talking to him about the age at end game, a couple other questions about how Japanese and Korean compare and uh, asking him you know, his story. So introduce yourself. How did you learn about age at and immersion learning and how did you learn Korean? Yep, so hi, I'm George and I am actually in Korea right now, as you can see from the background. Um, I learned Korean, well, it's been about four years now since I learned uh, using immersion learning. Before that, I did do some traditional uh, learning stuff for maybe two to three years, but that was very on and off. So um, my story then, of how I actually got to where I am today, was I originally in sort of middle school, I suppose. we In the UK, we don't really have middle school and high school. It's all one thing, but I'll just say middle school for the international viewers. Um, in middle school, I had a Korean friend who spoke or well, he didn't speak any English and he was, and he came to the UK and within about three years or so he had acquired English and I found that just very interesting because at the time I didn't really know much about foreign languages and foreign cultures, especially in the UK and in the West generally, we don't really have a sort of open mind about other cultures. So that was the first sort of insight that I'd found into yeah, the outside world. Then a few years passed by and I eventually started to take language learning more seriously because this person had learned my language, but I didn't learn anyone else's language. So I felt a little bit of a gap there. And I was like, well, why don't I learn Korean? As I'd gotten more interested in Korea through this friend of mine, et cetera, et cetera. So long story short, um, I started AJAT in 2020 because I found um, Matt Bush Japan's videos. I, I watched like all of his videos and I went to the AJAT blog and read the full site and I just applied it to Korea, which most learners who do Asia, I believe, are just doing it for Japanese. But I mean, there are a small, small number of Korean learners nowadays. Um, so yeah, I applied it to Korean. And you know, four years later, here I am. And we can get into the nitty gritty of that a little bit later on, but that's the brief storyline. Also, um, I'm in university here in Korea as well. So when I graduated high school, I did go to the UK. I went straight to Korea and I've been in university since, so yeah. I know you know a little bit about Japanese just through the community and stuff. Indeed. What do you think are like some similarities and differences between Korean and Japanese? Yeah, so actually when I studied Korean using the traditional method, so anything before 2020, I was a little bit interested in Japan as well at the time because I'd heard online that it was so popular and like all these cool things, you know, well, Japanese culture is so cool that they've got, you know, all these motorbikes and cars and anime and all sorts of different things, right? So I was a little bit interested. So I actually learned like hiragana, katakana through a textbook. I think I used the Genki textbook or something like that. Uh, and I also did remembering the kanji for like 300, 400 characters. Cause at this time I wasn't particularly like sold on one language that I should learn. So there was Korean in the back of my mind. Japanese was also in my mind. I was doing Spanish at school. I was also doing French uh, as my sort of, like not major, but the course you have to take. So there was a lot of languages on the table and it was very, it wasn't hard for me to choose, but at that point I wasn't focused in on one. So that's sort of my experience with Japanese. I've been to Japan before and I've had, you know, a very good time in the country. So I don't really have any, hold any hate towards it because a lot of, a lot of Korean people, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but because of the whole history of the Japanese empire colonizing Korea, a lot of Korean people still hold a slight resentment, especially the older generation towards Japan. The younger generation are a lot better now in terms of, you know, how they feel about each other. But there, there's been things like no Japan movements in Korea as well. So it's quite a uh, big phenomenon. Um, but how, in terms of similarities between the language, I think the biggest similarity is like sort of the, the word the word format, the word structure, like I suppose grammar and um, the, like the, the characters. So obviously this is kind of basic knowledge for people who already know about these languages, but you know, to be very brief, because Korean and Japanese share the same roots of like Chinese characters, that means that a lot of the words or the origins of the words are the same. So it's kind of like how Latin works for Romance languages. So for example, I don't know, like aqua, there might be, yeah, aqua is like the Latin and then we have like aquarium and in Spanish, it might be something similar, like same same concept for Korean and Japanese. I know there are some words that are like pretty much exactly the same. So for example, jumbi means probably the same thing in yeah. Japanese. And uh, in right? Chinese, there's a word oh, yeah? like, oh, really? like, jun, like jumbei or something and that. Yeah, also... like it's all just like slight tweak in pronunciation, but there's loads of those. So actually when I listen to Japanese myself, I do find a lot of words that I've picked up on here and there. And I actually have a, had a, I've had a classroom experience of learning Japanese in my Korean university because you have to take a foreign language when you first come. And I chose Japanese because, you know, that's the one I have the most experience in. So I, I do know like some basic vocab. So I suppose I'm a little bit uh, better than the average Korean learner who's only focused on Korean. 
Um, other similarities, I think, you know, culturally they are quite similar, although there are differences because uh, Japan is definitely a much more you know, economically developed country and culturally the influence is, is wider. Like even in Korea, you know, people love have some like, don, they call it donkatsu, but I think it's like donkatsu in Japanese, like the, yeah, yeah. the, the beef, yeah, that, that meal and like ramen, I know and all, all sorts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, and, and in Korea, they also have like, uh, they call it hui, but it's like not sushi, but sort of raw fish. Like oh, there's lots of Japanese dishes, lots of Japanese influence for sure. But Koreans really don't like to uh, admit or they're, they're kind of opposed to the, the fact that, you know, Japan has yeah, all this influence. Because, of because the you know, we've the history. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, pretty bad stuff. And I feel like a lot of Japanese learners, uh, some Japanese learners actually, don't know because you know, obviously, they have the Japanese Empire with like a flag. Mm -hmm. It's probably got a special name, right? Yeah. That is like almost like the Nazi symbol in Korea. Like, it's really, really bad. Whereas I see when I went to Japan, you know, I could see it here and there. Yeah, so, they, they actually yeah, fly in, in Japan. Dainihon Oh, Bukuru yeah. Bukuru is what it's called. And oh, yeah. They, they, you see like shirts and, and flags and yeah. stuff of it in Japan. Yeah, it's pretty mental. Um, or at least the Koreans don't like that. So <laughs> that's, that's a big difference. Yeah. But I've heard about the like, anti-Japanese demonstrations or protests and stuff like that in oh, yeah. in Korea because they talk about it on the Japanese news. Right. Yeah. I right. think Hanichi Demo is what it's called in Japanese. Oh, okay. So Hanichi yeah. is like anti like Han is anti. Ban. Probably oh, yeah. it's probably Ban 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 Ban, something, something like that. Like yeah, that. Like, and then Nichi yeah, is like yeah. like written as sun or day. Yeah, I know exactly. Yeah. Okay, I know exactly the word like in Korea. Yeah. <laughs> see there's so many like interesting similarities between the languages and also um i think korean also has a particle system that's really similar to japanese does. yes but the, actually the, the funny thing with the korean particle so i hear japanese learners talk about like what and ga and all this stuff and i, I can relate because the korean it has, has the that too thing. right yeah, yeah i know yeah. i've heard about that that's yeah, really it's interesting funny. yeah because but uh in korean it's like so japanese they just have wa and ga right whereas in korean it's like un or nun and then e or ga so it's like it changes a little bit on the grammar, but the concept is the same, yeah. And that's pretty much it. Gra grammatically as well, the, the languages are very similar, except Japanese is like, I feel from what I've learned, is a little bit more simpler in terms of the way it conjugates, because I think in Japanese, you don't have like a future, like you can't really say, I will do this. It's like, you say the present, yeah, yeah. In, in Korean, they have a future, so that okay, it makes so it's slightly more easier. complicated. Yeah. I see. But the so honorifics as well, it's quite, it's quite deep in Korean. I, I don't know about oh, Japanese, it's I think it's like, Two or three, right? Mm, Japan has a levels. lot of honorifics, actually. Or oh, yeah. do you mean like the different levels I mean, like of levels. formal speaking? Yeah, levels. Yeah, it yeah. has that. It has that. It actually goes really far in Japan, too. Like there's mm. the normal level, which people speak to them like each other on the street and, you know, yeah. in interpersonal interactions. And then there's like the level you speak at your company. Then there's like the level you speak to your boss and the level mm. you speak to the emperor and like what they speak yeah. in the in the like national diet and that kind of stuff so it's kind of all a little different it's all like a mm. little dialect of japanese each one yeah yeah i mean korean has the honorifics it has it's supposed to have like about five levels of it um however i actually don't know enough about japanese to say that oh korean has like higher or japanese yeah. higher. i think they i think it's very stuff, similar yeah. Um, yeah yeah probably i know japanese has a reputation for th having like a lot of that kind of stuff but it might just be more people study japanese so the word gets around yeah <laughs> probably yeah yeah uh, one interesting thing is um dialects because i suppose a slight difference maybe i mean and they do have dialects in japanese i know but um korean dialects they have about four or five i think or like main ones and um there's also jejudo dialects. so jeju island is like the island at the bottom of korea and there's also jejudo Saturi, which means like Jejudo dialect, which is actually mutually like unintelligible from standard Korean. So people speaking that, you know, won't understand each other. But for the rest of the dialects, they um, can be understood. But what's interesting is there's something a place called Gyeongsang-do, which is like the province in the south of South Korea, where they with like the, uh, which is the province home, the home of Busan, right? And in that dialect, they actually still have pitch accent. But the pitch accent isn't recorded anywhere in like any dictionary or online. You just kind of have to know. So <laughs> I actually am aware of this one person in the Korean learning community who basically acquired uh, Kyongsan Dool Saturday, like the Kyongsan Dool dialect. And he, he, he claims to know about pitch accent differences. So for like one example I can give just off the top of my head, there's the word in, the word in Korean, uh, uri means either we or like pigsty. 
like Tweji Uri, like pig style. So, but depending on whether you say like Uri or Uri, it, it means like either one in that dialect only. But when you go to Seoul, that doesn't apply. So it's quite, it's quite strange. I actually um, think it sounds really similar to Japanese though, because Japanese also okay. has a massive amount of dialects, many of which yeah. are mutually unintelligible. And oh, really? We, we, there's even our like dialects on islands that are really different. Like in Okinawa, there's, a, there's an Okinawan language that is basically oh, right. unintelligible. Mm, right, so it's just completely yeah, different from standard. Yeah, and what's, what's interesting is, um, <laughs> I don't know about if they make fun of people on Japanese TV, but in Korean TV, like especially like the variety shows, mm -hmm. they make kind of make fun of people from the dialect because they what actually do the when, exact same thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Like if if they pronounce it with like a weird pitch accent, they go like, "Hey, what the hell are you talking about?" They do the same. Oh wow, they, they do. That's interesting. And they yeah. there's kind of this uh, image that people who speak certain dialects are from the countryside or are less sophisticated, mm. and they'll make fun of those people. Oh wow, that's the exact same. Yeah, in Korea, if you speak with a dialect, like any dialect that isn't the Seoul dialect or Pilchen or like the standard uh, speech, um, that you're seen as like, yeah, slightly less or like, like people make fun of you. So I know a lot of people who are from the countryside, but they switch their language to yeah, speak exact same like thing the Seoul dialect. In Japan. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Like you wouldn't imagine that in like the West, would you? Like in America or UK, like people don't really change their dialects per se yeah. just to fit in. But so, if, yeah, you, quite... if you think about it, a lot of the young people mm. don't speak like Southern English, for example, in the U.S. anymore. Mm. They kind of don't really so. have such strong dialects. But not many people are like, oh, I'm going to fix my dialect anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not really the same thing. Yeah. But it's, it's so interesting how similar this is, actually. There's so yeah, many similarities <laughs> between Japan and Korea and, and these different aspects of the language. Yeah, I feel like I, I, I already know Japanese like in a past life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like when I listen to it, it's like, oh, I already know like what's going on. I just need to learn a bit more, you know? Yeah. Exactly. So have you thought you want to learn another language? Do you want to learn Japanese? <sighs> so this is getting into sort of my philosophy now. Um, originally I thought, okay, I'd master Korean and then I'll just move on to Japanese. It's like kind of a third language where I wouldn't really take it too far. Like I would just sort of dabble in it. Now, since I've I've, I've had a lot of thoughts around this this topic and my philosophy has changed, but originally, yeah, my philosophy was, okay, I'll just get fluent in five years or get to native level in five years and then just move on to the next language in five years, get native level and then cash out uh, maybe like three or four languages. Now I realized that, okay, native level is probably not attainable in just five years. Yeah. It, it takes a lot of it's constant dedication, constant work. Yeah, 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 it really is. And um, also I, I kind of devalued my own English ability at that time. Like I used to think that, oh, if I just master Korean, then everything will be okay. Whereas actually, you know, my English sort of articulation and fluency is still a good tool for me to have, you know, because we're in a global uh, universe or global world, right? So I think instead of just neglecting my other languages, so my Korean and English, I will probably just keep raising those up to the best that they can be. So, and, and a lot of people will be like, well, why don't you just, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's just a hobby. Like, why, why do you care? Um, I sort of found, I've been reading a lot lately, and one of the things that stuck to me was that speech is almost a, a means to power, right? The more precise you can be in your speech, the better you can communicate, the better sort of trade deals you can have and essentially sort of <laughs> raise your position in, in the hierarchy of society potentially, right? So maybe that's, you know, maybe that's the wrong reason to do it, but I find a lot of value in just improving my own speech in, in both English and Korean because I could just say, oh, well, you know, being really precise in my speech, being really native in my speech is, is not as important. So I'm going to drop Korean and just focus on my English. Yes. However, I kind of have that sort of, what is it? The sunk, sunk cost fallacy. Sunk where cost you, fallacy. That's right. Yeah. I've invested too much time into Korean now. So, and plus I do enjoy uh, using Korean and being Korean. But with that said, um, I think, you know, Japanese, like if I go on a trip to Japan, then I probably will just do some immersion and do some flashcards and just try and get a little okay. bit of my level up because why not? Uh, but my philosophy right now is, yeah, just focusing on Korean and English. Okay, right makes sense. I was actually learning uh, Chinese for like two, three months at the beginning of this year. But I decided to not do that and focus on Japanese and also my schoolwork because I'm you know, going into a career and stuff and I wanted to do well, which I ended, ended up doing. But I decided to put Korea or Chinese on hold. I almost said Korean. Put Chinese on hold for now. Um, yeah, yeah. But it, it was interesting. I enjoyed studying it. But... There's mm. not actually that much benefit to learning a language in the first place if you're not going to go there. So <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of true because you, you don't get to meet that many natives in your own country. 
and like yeah it only really the real value is once you go there or you start making friends yeah and with just japanese i was able to meet so many people even where i live and build a friend group oh, really? around that so mm, yeah. i'm pretty satisfied with that because yeah, i that's, that's good the place i am there's a lot of international students and people from abroad in this city i live in phoenix arizona and there's a there's a college here which has a lot of international students so i'm able to make friends using japanese there mm. That's the place to be, really, if you're learning a language. So, yeah. so what about differences in resource availability between Japanese and Korean? <laughs> Tell us, Japanese learners, how good we have it. Oh, yeah, good God. Yeah. So, um, for Japanese, you guys get dubs of everything. And, you know, there's pretty much a infinite amount of resources in terms of media. Or Not, not infinite, but, mm -hmm. you know, but if English was number Near one, I, I bet money... I bet money that Japanese is number two. Like the amount of media is great. So, and that, that's just me looking in from the outside. Um, the only thing I've watched in Japanese recently, I don't know if some of the viewers might know, is um, there's a, there's a program called Breaking Breaking Down. I think yeah, it's called. It's I like know. a UFC. Yeah, yeah. I've been watching a bit of that because it's just entertaining. And they have, they have some ones with like Korean subtitles. So I've been watching that. Um, but outside of that, Korean uh, media. So no one in Korea watches dubs. Like it's it's really really. Surprise, surprise me, but even if there is a Korean dub, like 90% of people are not going to watch it because they just hate how Korean sounds dubbed, apparently. Um, and in terms of Korean dubs, there's really, really not a lot out there. I know like Cobra Kai on Netflix got, got a Korean dub, so I watched it in Korean just to be like, you know, just immersion build or whatever. But for the most part, that's the dubbing side of things. Um, book translations, there's a lot of, you know, most books, like, you know, for example, like Jordan Peterson or I don't know, Self-help books, they're all translated into Korean, which is nice. Like business books as well. Like book selection is really good. Um, dramas. So the main thing that people immerse here, but immerse with here in Korea are, you know, Korean dramas. So Korean dramas, you know, fairly self-explanatory, right? But there's also webtoons, which is not the same as manga. So Japanese learners, they really love manga, right? And like comic books style, you know, just traditional manga. Whereas webtoons, for people who aren't really too sure what it is, it's like manga, but in color, and it's it's got Korean origins. And it's actually, I think, not, I'm not sure if it's the original one, but there's a, there's a Korean company called Naver. So Naver is like the Korean Google. So there's Naver, Kakao, and like Taom is oh, yeah. like the third one. I've heard yeah, of you like know Kakao Talk. They actually use yeah, that Kakao in, Talk. in Japan too, but it's not as popular oh, really? as Korea. Oh, really? Wow. I didn't know they used it in Japan. Yeah, because I, I thought Japan, they used Line. They like, do use Line, but people, some people also have Kakao Talk. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah, because it's, it's originally a Korean thing as far as I'm aware. Um, but where was I going with that? So yeah, there's, there's Kakao Webtoon, Naval Webtoon. I think there's Daum Webtoon, maybe. But those are like three big sort of tech companies in Korea. Now, Naval Webtoon is the one that I consume the most. And when I was learning Korean, I think the, the, <laughs> the thing that gave me the motivation to carry on was actually reading Webtoons. So I would you know highly recommend that people do use that as a resource if they're going to learn. But yeah, in terms of difference with Japanese, I think, yeah, you guys have it so good. Like even games as well. Um, Japanese games, they all get dubbed, whereas the Korean equivalents only get subtitles. And, uh, you know, a lot of movies, so uh, yeah. I mean, I could rant on for ages, but also Korean YouTube is is not really popping. Like, I, I don't know too much about Japanese YouTube, but the style of Korean YouTube is like watching YouTube from like the 2000s again, like, you know, like the big blocky text and like the flashy, yeah, you know, just kind of corny stuff. I mean, <laughs> Japanese mm. YouTube is still kind of like that, but I think there's more yeah. quality content available in Japan, yeah. most likely. Yeah, do they have like like uh, high quality, like sort of film style content? Like, you know, we see in the West, like these big podcasts mm -hmm. and all of that, that they have like- They more have sort of that some stuff. of it, but not, it's not like the West, but they do have a little bit of it, depends. All oh, right, so it's, it's sort of. Easy. I think I've seen a little bit because I've done some Japanese immersion myself. There's like some podcasts, and you know, I think Japanese Japan has a lot more podcasts as well. Korea basically has like zero podcasts. Like they, good they luck. They have they have like these radio shows in Japan, and those are yeah. like the Japanese podcasts. They call them like, right. da radio, but it's ah, it's it's just yeah. podcasts. Right, yeah. right, right. And they yeah, all get upload, they all get uploaded to YouTube, so you can listen to them on YouTube. Mm, that's really nice. Yeah, Korean podcasting has only actually become a thing recently. So, you know, with like the rise of like Andrew Huberman, Chris Williams and all these like Western podcasts, um, only since like last year have there been Korean podcasts popping up. So I think there's about four or five major podcasts that are 
you know, in that sort of high budget, uh, sort of similar to the Western style, um, which has been quite interesting to see because Korea likes to follow the trend, obviously America as well. So it is interesting to see that there have been finally some podcasts, but that, that would have been good while I was learning. But hey, um, yeah, Korean is lacking in podcasts. But anyway, media, I think that pretty much covers everything, right? What about um, books and, and stuff like that? Are they, yeah, so with are there the a books, lot of books published in Korea? There's tons in Japan. Yeah, um, there's actually surprisingly a decent amount if you if you look for it. Um, a lot. I actually read. So when I, when I was reading, or when I was getting into reading, I would read a lot of just translated, you know, English books. So whatever self help thing. Whereas now I, I'm trying to specifically read books written by Korean authors, and now they they do vary in quality. But because Korea has quite an emphasis on education. There's a lot of university professors who do write some quality stuff. So it's not, probably not going to be as much as Japan, but it's actually, you know, satisfactory. And what you do find is like, there's a Korean version of a book that's almost like a rewrite of some Western books. So for example, How to Win Friends and Influence People is quite a popular one. I read a book today and it's basically just sort of a re, uh, remix of that book, but just written by a Korean author. So yeah, there, there are some, not not sort of copycat, but yeah, yeah remix books. I have that book um, in Japanese. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I've never read it in English. I just had this, yeah, the Korean version. Here's so. here's my Japanese version. It's called Hito Ugokasu, oh, wow. which is like it means like move people. And then ah. there, he actually has another book, which is I don't yeah. know what the oh here the English titles on here. How to stop worrying and start living. Mitsuhiro <laughs> and I have this ah. one as well. Yeah, it's funny how the titles are translated differently as well. So with uh with this one, it says uh Ingang Kwangiron, which means like human relationship theory or something like that, okay. which is you know completely different. To oh, do they have a word that friends. is like human relationship in Korean too? Like, yeah, exactly. Like in, we have this, mm-hmm. in Japanese. There's Ningen Kanke, which even oh, sounds kind of wow. similar. Yeah, it's like pretty much the same word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about? Uh, tools and dictionaries and those kind of things. Oh, like we have yeah. so much of that stuff God. in Japanese because there, a lot, there's a lot of nerds learning Japanese who are good mm. at programming. So they create all these convenient tools to do everything for us. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are really blessed with that. Um, <laughs> so Korean um, only really has like two dictionaries, uh, maybe three that you can, you can reliably use. I think one, there's only, I only use one personally and that's the neighbor dictionary. So neighbor is like the global not the global the uh conglomerate that just pretty much has power over korean the korean internet right um and that dictionary is really good except there's like one or two like minor flaws with it but for the most part it's really good so you only really need to use it the only downside is there's no offline korean dictionary i haven't found a korean dictionary a korean to korean dictionary that works offline oh, so really? if someone could make that please that would be not, really not helpful a yeah one there must, yeah, there must be somewhere you can that. get the, like the original dictionary downloadable somehow. Yeah. And uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention while we're talking about media is Korea is really, really uh, strong on piracy. Like they, they do not allow piracy. Like they've locked everything down. So I know, you know, I'm just going to say it like openly that in the West, like if you want to get a book, you can just go to a certain website, download it in English. I, I think it's similar to Japanese. There's yeah. a lot of pirated stuff. Yeah, Japanese whereas... and English, especially English, you can get anything Japanese, you can get yeah. almost anything. Right, yeah. With, with Korean, it's the complete opposite. You can't get pretty much anything pirated, so you do have to buy it legitly. But luckily, for people who like reading books, there's a service. So Kyobo Mungo is like the biggest bookstore in Korea, and they have like a subscription service. So where you basically you pay about maybe it's like ten US dollars per month, but you get sort of unlimited access to the books on there, and you can read them. So that's what I've been doing. And it's it's a, little, a small price to pay, but. It works. And also for audiobooks as well, you have to pay. But, Are you able to download yeah. digital copies of those books? Yes, but not uh, outside of the app. So it's like you can't oh, like so you, you can't, pirate it. You if can't you wanted pirate to. it. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was yeah. wondering. If you could download it and then remove yeah. the DRM and distribute mm-hmm. it. But I know of someone in the, the Korean community who, who pirated uh, like a bunch of books and like put it in like a mega file. Like there's like some sacred mega file, but God knows how they did it because it's really, really difficult and they've like really cracked down on, on that. And I, I don't know, also just another cultural thing. In Japan, I think I've said this to you before, but in Korea they have like some injun, like boninjun. So you have to like verify yourself. Um, so you, everyone, I'm not going to show you my card because I don't want to like. Yeah, I, myself, I know what you're talking about though. Yeah, that is like really severe. So I couldn't get a phone number 
or make a phone for like three months because I didn't have my, what they call Shimpunjun, like a ID card. Um, and there's stuff like that with the verification. So Korean bureaucracy is really intense, which is why, you know, piracy is, is gone. Like it, it's really hard or really hard or really non-existent. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's, that's basically what I was trying to get at. I think Korea is considered one of the like least free first world nations in the world. Yeah, it probably sounds about right, to be honest. Like, it is a little bit locked down. Um, I mean, I don't feel, I don't, I don't ever feel like, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. But there are some times, yeah, with like the piracy or I think legally, yeah. 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 I, but I, I think don't feel like at risk. Yeah, mm. legally. But I think, I think it might be a result of the fact that like Korea has developed next to North Korea in kind of this wartime state where the government mm. has a lot of power. Yeah. I think that's yeah. probably a factor. Yeah. The North Korea thing. Actually, I, haven't even, I wasn't even thinking about that, but um, that's, that's how most people in Korea live. They just don't even think about it. Until like it comes on the news. How do you feel about like the Korean economy and the, the what's the situation in Korea? Like, is the is it actually a place you'd want to move to and and have your life there? Because I've heard a lot of negative things about life and the economy in Korea. Mm, yeah, I think it's quite easy to hate on Korea. Um, I'm living here now, and I'll probably be here for the next at least three years. Um, will I be here long term? I don't know. That's that's more based on like the political thing of the north and south, and just generally. You know, the air quality is not very good here as well. That's another like massive downside. A lot of Koreans say that the air quality is bad because it's blown over from China. But to be honest, I don't know how much I believe that. I think, you know, there's, there's, there's arguments for both. Um, so, yeah, but that's that's not so good. Economy, um, the house prices in Seoul are just ridiculous. Like to buy a house, I think it's like chip ok, so ok, like 10 ok, so like 10 billion i think oh, i don't know i don't know how it oh, works oh, yeah, out yeah. Too, i um, know what you're talking about though because you know Japan what i'm talking about the right yeah oku. it's called oku uh, oh okay yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll put it on the screen how much that translates to yeah 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 um so that's how much like a apartment costs in Seoul. it's like it doesn't even buy you that much you know um so that, the, the house pricing is ridiculous um food prices are really high as well like groceries are some of the highest in the world i believe um so that's a bit of pain but in terms of convenience korea is awesome like you can order anything at any time like you can order like i've heard of people like ordering bed uh like mattresses and it come like the next couple of days or something like that so it's very very convenient um i don't know if you, you guys can probably see the background on, on this camera you can see the background there's like some apartments out there korea or at least seoul is not very attractive looking place in terms of like the city like it all the apartments a, are like this it kind of has like a mm. commie block look from what i've seen it really is yeah it is kind of commie block especially where i live there are nicer places of course and obviously, if you're like, you know, money is no object, then you'll be fine. You'll be living in a really nice place. But if you don't really, if you value aesthetics quite a lot, at least in terms of like the environment, then yeah, Korea is probably not the best place to live long term. Um, with that said, though, I think learning Korean and coming into Korea is definitely like it's still a good opportunity. And the reason why is because everybody, you know, goes, well, not everybody, but a lot of people aspire to go to Japan and do that thing, which is fine, you know, if that's your thing. But if you're like on the fence, and you're choosing between Korea and Japan. <laughs> obviously, I'm biased. Obviously, I'm super biased. But I think Korea still definitely has value because it's a path that not a lot of people take. And you learn sort of different things. Like, you know, I could have done the, the Japanese route and, you know, still enjoyed myself and had a great time. But I feel like because I've done the Korean path almost, I could still enjoy some of the Japanese stuff. But I, I know a lot of things. I've had a lot of different experiences because it's, it's not quite the same. Because like, what I'm trying to get at is going from the UK to Japan, it's like going from you know first world country to super developed first world country. It's like sort of the same sort of lifestyle. Whereas because Korea is a little bit underdeveloped, you do have different experiences, and it is it's quite interesting in that respect. But yeah, in terms of living and just society, yeah, it's not always the best to be a foreigner. Like a lot of people idolize, oh, if you're a foreigner in Korea or Japan, then you know people are going to treat you differently. It's going to be great. But people treat you differently, but not necessarily in a good way. And it's it it does get a bit annoying when people like for example i recently started um boxing and like mma just as a hobby and i went to the gym there and like even though i, sp I spoke like purple not perfect but great like high levels of korean um they would just kind of try and speak to me in english and they wouldn't really get that i could speak korean you know what i mean it's like they didn't, didn't really register um so there, there's a lot of that it's, it's not it's not really racism it's just a, a lack of understanding which you know i can't blame anyone for that but longer term that might be you know bothersome for some people so yeah
I yeah, think, that's pretty much. I think in Japan, the idea that foreigners can speak Japanese is getting around. There's a lot of foreigners who speak Japanese now. They're on TV. Um, they're on YouTube. But I, it seems like there's way less people in Korea that are non-Korean and speak Korean fluently. 100%. 100%. Yeah, I only know of like a couple. I can count them a hand, right? So <laughs> that kind of says it all. Yeah. Um, oh, one other question. I wanted to ask about yeah. uh, the what's... What do, do they talk about the demographic tr uh, transition crisis in Korea very much? Because Korea, oh, Korea actually yeah. has the lowest birth rate in the world. And people, <laughs> people always talk about Japan, but Japan mm. actually has the highest birth rate in um, East Asia. So right. what, what is that like, like in Korea? Do you not see many young people? Do people talk about that? Mm, yeah, that, that's always like the point of discussion in school, like in university at the moment. They always talk about it. Um, <laughs> I don't really know what the solution is. I think it's, it's to do with like housing because right, like I said, the house prices are really, really high. So no one can buy a house and then no one wants to get married here as well. That is a massive sentiment of like, oh, we don't want to get married, don't have kids. So there's a lot of that. Um, yeah, as far as solution, I, I don't really know, but it is quite a popular point, uh, like a conversation topic. And they, I think it's predicted like the Korean population will be like almost like half or something like ridiculous. In By 2060, like I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. So I don't really know how that's going to work, which is why <laughs> that, I'm not too sold on being here long term. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can't support an economy with such a small population of young people. Mm. It's pretty mm. it's pretty terrifying. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I just thought of another point. Um, when I went to Japan, I actually found like, a lot of Korean speakers there, which is which is quite strange. Um, but I almost got by better in Japan because I spoke Korean rather than like knowing Japanese, like a weird way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously if I knew Japanese, it would be better, but because I spoke English and Korean, I actually like pretty much didn't have much of a problem, but at least in Tokyo. So um, there's, there's a, quite a lot of a uh, Korean population in Tokyo, at least I found, but maybe that was just, you know. What, my, where my, are they? So. How'd you find them? Yeah, uh, so, I mean, I, ju I was just walking around. I think I went like- Just go? walking around? Yeah, like, where did I go? I think like Shin Okubo is like the Korean town, right? Oh yeah, I know that place. Yeah, I, I went there. Um, I went around to like all of like the hot spots, you know, not not anywhere too off beaten track. But you know, I just I, I don't know. I, I maybe that's just my experience, but there's there's quite a lot of Korean population in Tokyo. So you know, maybe if Korea you know goes to hell, then I might just have to go to Japan. <laughs> I don't know. That makes sense though. <laughs> the countries are really close, and Korean stuff is really popular in Japan. There's Korean culture is really popular. And there's lots of people who are learning Korean, especially yeah. young, young girls. There's a big demographic yeah. of young girls in Japan learning Korean. A hundred percent. Yeah, I see it a lot in my university because we get a lot of exchange students from Japan. And uh, the Japanese students are always like some of the best at Korean, at least out of the foreign students. So yeah, I could totally vouch for that. Yeah. Mm. What about in, in Korea? Is Japanese stuff popular in Korea? It depends. I think... Like I said earlier, the, the culture, cultural impact is huge. Like there's ramen, you know, donkas or whatever, like all these Japanese uh, foods, right? Uh, anime and that sort of thing is quite popular. Actually, recently, so in Japan, I know they have like, I think it's Shinjuku. It's like the, the hot spot for like, a, like not anime, but like that kind of party lifestyle, right? Um, whereas there's a place in Korea called Hongdae, which is like the number one place for, I guess, the party lifestyle, but also it's like the hotspot for like anime and like otaku culture, at least okay. what, what's left of kind it in of Korea. Like so Akihabara yeah. in Japan. Yeah, it's kind of like Akihabara, but it's really, really small scale. <laughs> like only recently there's one building, there's a building called the AK Plaza, which is now just like full of like anime figurines and stuff. Whereas before to find that stuff in Korea was like really hard. So there's like one building, which is like re resembling of um, Akihabara. And like, you know, in Japan, there's like the, like, is it Toho cookies? So like the, the kids? The, yeah. Is that right? It's a yeah. Toyoko. Toyoko kids. Toyoko kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that 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 uh phenomenon, right? That's actually started in Korea. So next to this this building with the AK Plaza, yeah, there's like a there's a garden or a um like a uh, a park, which I actually live on this road, by the way. And if you go to the end of it, you see like all these 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 girls doing like TikTok dances dressed up in like the like Otaku style and stuff. So yeah, it's the Japanese influence is, is coming to Korea. Um, but outside of that small district in Seoul, it's it's really I don't see much much of it at all. Like especially like people dressing differently and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Let's get into a discussion of language learning.
I wanted to ask you about your opinions on reading versus listening. What did you do and what do you recommend? What do you think is better? Sure. Um, so <laughs> what I think is better, probably listening first. Like I think it's undeniable at this point. Um, if you listen, you will get a better accent. You will speak better because the way we convert you know, to speech is, is by listening to sound, right? Language itself is sound. It's not a written thing. So we learn our native language through getting sound in audio input and then producing that as audio output, right? The, the, the writing thing is just another tool that we've made to you know, increase our vocabulary. So I would highly recommend you do a lot of listening. Did I do a lot of listening? Uh, probably not enough. Like my accent is okay, but it's, you know, it could be better because I, I, I kind of lack in listening, to be honest. But what did I do instead? I read, read, and read a lot. So my actual vocabulary is pretty good. It's just that my accent is, is not, it's, it's not awful. Like, but I know there are people who are pretty bad, right? This is like amongst the immersion learners. Um, but I'm quite critical of my own accent. I think it could be improved. And the way I, I would improve it is by listening. But I think you might have seen the video by Matt Bash Japan where it says like, if you're reading pretty much outtakes you're listening, then you kind of screwed up your accent, like almost permanently, um, which I think is what ha has happened to me. So I, I, at this point, I've just accepted that, okay, well, my accent might not be perfect, but I'm just going to carry on, you know, reading and just trying to improve in all areas. So I'm not actually focused on any just listening or just reading. But if I was like trying to optimize the native level and be the best I ever could, then I would probably just like only listen to audio books like 10 hours a day. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I, how I think about it. Mm. How do you feel your vocabulary is? Can you quantify it? Do you have any idea how many words you know? Like, I probably know between like 20,000 to 25,000 words in Japanese. Okay, wow. Well. Do you, how do you quantify that though? Is that I, have, cards or? I have like 23,000 Anki cards, um, but I have a lot of pre-made cards and then I have my own cards and combined, I think it's like somewhere around 20,000 total. And then I also, there's tons of words I never put into Anki that I know, but obviously my active vocabulary is much less, but with words I can understand, there's very few I don't know. Like actually, um, a couple months ago, I went to... I'm volunteering at this like uh, English school or language school for students from abroad learning English at my college. Oh yeah. And there right. was a group of Japanese students there and I was talking to them and they were like, mm. they kept asking me like, do you know this word? Do you know this word? And they kept like <laughs> trying to come up with the Just weirdest, the... most rare words or like slang words that they, and they, they couldn't find a word I didn't know. They were so mm. shocked. That's funny. That's really funny. Yeah. I feel like I've heard that before in like another Japanese learners video. Like it seems like Japanese people like to, um, yeah, test how far you know that they don't really believe. <laughs> I've never had that in Korea, at least in my experience. Um, what was I say? Yeah, so words I know. So for Anki cards, I think I have like around eight and a half thousand, which is not a lot, right? Because I, I took a break from Anki for like about a year. So I didn't mention that. But when the, the Matt vs. Japan video was like, oh, you don't need Anki came up. I, I kind of quit Anki for like, yeah, pretty much a year. But I've only recently started to get back into it. So, yeah, it's hard to quantify, but it definitely eight, eight and a half thousand in terms of Anki cards. But yeah, I don't know. When I read a book, there's like one word per page. I don't know. That's, that's like still average. So I don't know if that's low. I, I, I probably could. It's getting better now because I'm in university and I'm seeing new words every day. But um, yeah, it's probably not in the 20,000 range. It's probably maybe okay. like 15K. It's probably 15 to 20,000. Yeah. 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 Probably in terms of like passive and all of that. So, yeah. I, I actually found, well, reading is a great way to pick up words and expand your vocabulary. I actually found that passive listening was one of the best ways that I grew my vocabulary because I would listen to content that's a little bit more difficult. Like there's this guy, Hiroyuki, and he, in his streams, he has these really long streams where he answers questions about a whole wide range of topics like finance, um, you know, stocks business and he talks about like romance relationships friendships uh social connections all this kind of stuff he basically yeah, talks about stuff. everything and so yeah i listen he has like tons of videos but i actually passive listened there was like a period where i passive listened to every single video he ever made and it was so many hours of <laughs> wow. content but when i finished that i felt like i had a much bigger vocabulary because i mean i was already fluent in japanese at that point so i could just listen to it in the background and still learn the new words because they were relatively rare. And I looked stuff up and added it to my list of words whenever I could. Um, but I felt like 
just doing that still helped improve my vocab a lot. As long as I was paying attention and trying to like remember the words. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, that that you have to get to a certain level for that to become effective? So like, you know, you want to get to a certain level like where you can just podcast. Kind of, mm -hmm. that, that's you have to be at least intermediate for that to be effective. And right. for like near fluency, it's going to be more effective. But at higher levels, yeah. if you pass them, passive listen, obviously not to low level content, you need to passive listen mm. to high level content and then you can actually still learn a lot. Mm. I suppose that's how natives would get some new vocabulary, maybe less so from audio stuff, but even so, right? Like for example, if I listen to like a Jordan Peterson lecture, I still learn it. I'm learning like three words a second, you know? So um, there is, there is levels to, yeah, I think the audio, audio is well. definitely the way. Audio books mm. as well. I think can, yeah. you can have the same effect. 100%. Yeah, I think audiobooks are like probably the best source of emerging content. It's just a shame they don't have as much like a widespread availability in Korea. Because at the moment, I, I didn't touch on audiobooks earlier, but there's only like two or about two reliable platforms for audiobooks here in Korea. So, but the selection is not really that big. So, yeah, it needs to catch on. I think the problem is with Korea is that um, there's one thing about Korean culture is that it's there's something called Bali Bali Munhwa, which means like, fast, fast, fast paced culture. And Koreans really love to get things, you know, done quickly, like quick, quick, quick. That's, that's pretty much the, like, the fundamental uh, staple of like Korean culture. So P Koreans tend to prefer just like quick, you know, five minute YouTube videos over like long form content or, you know, quick summaries rather than listening to the full book or the full versions, which it's just, that's just a trend of like people who are young anyway. But um, because of that, I feel like there's a lack of demand for podcasts and audiobooks, which is a slight shame. But you know, they do exist if you can't find them. I feel like in the in the West, there's obviously short videos are really popular. YouTube shorts, TikTok, those kind of things. But there's also like a under like a productivity undercurrent. Like a lot of young people are getting into this productivity stuff, so they're more attuned to long form content, podcasts, self development mm. kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. I think that's exactly where it comes from. It's the <laughs> in, in the old days, we used to have just like gym bros who just lift, uh, and that would be the the peak of like you know, self improvement or whatever. Whereas nowadays, you get all the gym bros, but nowadays they're like super enlightened, so they just talk about like you know <laughs> whatever like masculinity and all these topics, right? Um, so it is is quite interesting, um, but it, it's funny. What what I'm really sort of grateful for is that the fact that me and you have both learned other languages and gone to different places. You can see how actually what's reflected in the Western media isn't like representative of the rest of the world. And, you know, just because a lot of people prefer like long form podcasts or whatever, doesn't mean that the rest of the world is still thinking that way. So it's, it's quite, uh, it's nice to be able to take a sort of break out of like the whole self-improvement space. Because when you consume too much self-improvement content on like English YouTube, it does kind of get to you and you think like, oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Whereas if you, <laughs> when I, I found this, when I watch like some Korean stuff, it's like, well, actually, you know, most people here don't even know what self-improvement is. So <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's the yeah, same it's, it's in nice Japan. Balance. There's this guy, mm. um, Joji, and he's like oh, yeah. he's like <laughs> the only popular. Well, there's a couple others now, but when he mm. came out, he was like the only um, self improvement YouTuber in Japan. Oh right, but okay, he's yeah. he's kind of like you know who Hamza is in English. Yeah, YouTube? yeah, I know. He's kind yeah. of like Japanese Hamza or Japanese <laughs> Andrew Tate. He's kind of like oh wow, uh, like the red pill. He's the face YouTuber. of the red pill in Japan. But before oh, wow. he was making videos, which he started like two years ago, maybe. Something mm -hmm. like that. There yeah. was like no red pill in Japan. There was wow. no self improvement yeah. space. Yeah, actually, I should tell you what. There's there's a there's a channel called Red Pill Korea. So the, the Korean YouTube <laughs> scene is like really funny at the moment. Like there's a massive controversy. So there's there's a yeah Red Pill Korea. So this guy who's he's not really like the best looking. He's like kind of like a nerdy looking guy. But from like two or three years ago, he just started translating essentially what was on like uh, the Rational Mail like Red Pill blog or whatever. And he was just translating that, I'm learning it to YouTube. And now there's like a massive controversy. There's him and there's someone called Hukja Heise, which means like, Hukja means like sur surplus. So um, this guy is like a gym bro. And he, he makes like just long form content. In fact, he's probably one of the only Korean YouTubers who makes long form content. He just sits down and talks about like, you know, the best bro split or whatever. Uh, and then th this other guy, Red Pill Korea, uh, they had like a controversy. They started fighting over certain things. And now they have like full on debates and, it's really interesting because there's like the red pill, the Korean version of the red pill is quite different to, or maybe maybe it came from the West, but there's, there's been some sort of change in idea where like uh, all these guys, the Korean red pill is quite quite toxic. It's like, oh, I must meet a girl who's like never had any intercourse, it's like a virgin and that's the ultimate thing. Like it's quite, yeah, it's been skewed a bit. So um, 
yeah, I just want to say that there's um there is red pill in Korea. It's just uh yeah, kind of not the same. It's, that sounds well, it's, like it's lost its roots. That sounds like mm. the old red pill in the West. It used to be like that, and yeah. then it kind of reformed in the mm. past couple. That's, of I years. think what's happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really funny because <laughs> when when <laughs> when I speak to Korean people who, who who know about the red pill, or they claim to be RPO well, um, they they really have. Like all the, all they say is like, oh yeah, looks, money, status, game. Like they just, they just tell tell me stuff from like, you know, the old red pill in the West. So I think that whatever translation has been coming through, because I don't really watch it, um, has been translated of like older blogs. So it is, yeah, it's interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that used to be the the thing with the red pill, and now it's become a little more wholesome. I think. Yeah, you'd hope so. I mean, <laughs> you never really know. The Japanese one is more like the West. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Korea, Koreans love to take things to the extreme, so yeah, we'll see. But um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd be interested to find um, like a Korean blog because at the moment, I, I forgot to mention as well, there's not really many Korean blogs. Like people upload a lot of YouTube, and all blogs in Korea, or like 99% of blogs in Korea, are run by Naver. So I, I told you Naver is like the, the search engine, but there's also something called Naver Blog, which is just like it's kind of like WordPress, but just for Koreans. Um, and loads and loads of blogs are uploaded on Naver, but the problem is with that is like the format is all the same. So every website just looks the same. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's really quite an interesting phenomenon. But outside of that, I don't think there's many people starting actual blogs because there's a trend in Korea to follow the crowd. Like, I don't know if it's because of like the collectivist sort of nature or whatever. In fact, people do say Korea is not collectivist, it's relationist, but you know, we can get into that uh, later on. But yeah, there's definitely a tendency to follow the crowd. And if you look at any any sort of Korean fashion thing as well, like because everyone in Korea wants to be so special, they end up dressing the same because they all try and follow the same trend. Um, I'm not sure about this really a thing in Japan, but if you in Korea, like you go on the street, like one year it was like the long padded coats, the next year it's like a different trend. Like for example, now there's a bag that's popular in Japan uh, amongst girls, and like all the Korean girls are wearing it because it's like you know, trendy. So yeah, Korea is definitely one to follow the trend and follow the crowd, which is something I don't really like as much i see so, mm, makes mm, sense mm. it sounds like a more extreme version of japan in that regard yeah <laughs> yeah it sounds about right um i think i think with the korean sentiment it's like because they were well, like poor for so long and now they've started to thrive it's like now let's get everything we can while we can kind of thing uh, I think there's a lot of that, that mindset yeah, yeah 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 okay yeah so what are your opinions on output how early do you uh, think people should output what are ways to improve your output? What do you uh, recommend? Yeah, so I mean, I'm still scared of outputting now. <laughs> um, but I started output, I think, one and a half years to two years in. And that was like a little bit early. I probably could have waited. But when I say I started output, I did like an hour a week of like talking with a tutor. Um, you probably don't need to do that. But it, it's difficult. I don't think there's, there's really one thing I can recommend. But I would say get at least a year and a half. To, but I'd probably say get two years first of input be that listening be that reading being like whatever just get two years of solid input you know at least i'm saying at least four hours a day minimum uh and then from there you you can do it by the way what i think there's some people who are opposed to texting korean people or texting using it i think you could text from day one i don't think texting really makes a big difference um that, that's quite maybe a different opinion uh, but in terms of speaking uh and yeah, actually having longer form conversations or like writing longer form there's a text, I'd wait at least two years. And I think the longer you can put it off, almost the better. But it, it does depend on your life circumstances. Because for me, when I was like three years in, I was in Korea, so I had to output a lot. So yeah, the longer the better, but after two years, you're probably okay. It would be my my recommendation. I think it's it's yeah. kind of interesting because our stories are very similar. How long have you been studying Japanese again? When did you start? Uh, I studied Korean since... Oh, sorry, Korean. <laughs> 20, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 2020, so okay. March 2020. Yeah, for for so yeah. We started at almost the exact same time, and we we studied really similar. Like we both studied really hardcore using a traditional AJAP method with bare bones tools, and we both started we both started outputting one and a half years in, which I also started outputting at that time. Um, I was a little bit more listening focused, but I think we have a really similar story. We learned really similar, and a lot of our opinions mm. are similar. Yeah, that's great. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I, don't know, I kind of really, I look at the Japanese learning community and it's like, wow, I wish I wish I had that uh, sort of, there's other role models for Korean. Because <laughs> like I said, there's only like two or three other people doing this for Korean. So all these people who've got like good 
So uh, yeah, that's that's why I like about the HR stuff. But yeah, it's great to have, have like actually met you because at least we're we might not have the same language, but we're on the same sort of path. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's good. Did is there a Korean refold or like a Korean jet learning community? Yeah. There is, there is the Korean refold, but if I'm being honest, I've, I've been in there before and most of the people in there, yeah, you know how refold is, it's not really like hardcore, like people doing like an hour a day and stuff. So they're not really true age actors in my opinion. So in my, yeah. Do you feel sort of like you based. couldn't relate to them? Cause I also kind of feel like I don't fit in on refold. It's like mm. a lot of, same. it's a lot of like people are studying less and they're really mm. focused on like anime. I love anime, which is great, but yeah. like. I was more like, I was more like, you know, I like anime, but my goal is to learn Japanese where they're like, my goal is Mm. to watch anime. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And Mm. and, and like the, they use a lot of like, there's a lot of new ideas and new tools and stuff that I'm not really up to date Mm. on. So I kind of feel out of place in there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I just found with the the refill service, especially for Korean, there's just so much talk and not a lot of doing. Like, I think that was actually on the original AJAP blog you said about, you know, All right. So, sorry about that, guys. The, the uh, camera just cut out, so we're going to switch to his webcam. The audio quality might get a little worse, but bear with me. Um, so we were talking about the Korean Refold learning community. Yeah, so I was saying with Refold that at least my experience with the Korean Refold is that there's a lot of people who talk about learning the language rather than actually getting down to business. Now, it's if you read the original age up blog, he also said that you shouldn't mess around with like language learning forums because you end up consuming those of English and not focusing on Japanese. Right? It's a similar situation that I found with any Discord or community that it's nice to have friends or sure, like for sure, like make friends and try and you know use it, if, utilize it if you can. But if, if it's too distracting and you don't have the discipline, then I'd say you're probably better off not being in the repo stuff. And also, the, the sentiment of refold is not very hardcore. Like, People like us, people like you and me, are really hardcore, and we want to get like really good, right? We don't just get average or you know, do a few hours a day. So, for, for the real ones out there, you probably are better off not being in these communities for at least you know a few years, or maybe actually, what I, you could do what I did, which is like jump in and out of them. So every couple of months, go in, check, see if they've got some resources, see like what's going on, maybe say hi, get in a call with some other language learners, discuss your progress, and then maybe the next month get out. I think so. You wanna make sure you're in control, not the group being in control of you. Because there's way too many people out there who say they're learning a language, but they spend only like an hour a day. They do like a little bit of Anki, maybe Duolingo or something like that, God forbid. And they just spend all day on the forums. So it's, you know, don't talk about it, just do it. Like that's the, uh, the sort of thing I want to leave the viewers with. Yeah. And another thing is like, there's a lot of overthinking. Like people in these communities, they're always discussing what's the most efficient way? What's the best tool? What should I immerse with? But you, you're never going to immerse if all you're doing is talking about immersing. You just have to, you just have to do it. And yes, there are more efficient ways to learn a language. But if you're doing immersion, you're doing like what me and you know, a lot of other people online recommend, you're okay. You, you can just do that. You don't need to set up five tools. You don't need to jink, like mess around with Anki all day. All you need is just the bare bone stuff and you will learn the language. What's important is that you just do it and you put in the time. Exactly. You're already on one of the best methods, the best sort of protocols that that is for learning. And so, yeah, I wouldn't stress about that. Yeah, people do stress too much about the details, don't they? They're like, oh, but what if I don't have the right kanji font or whatever, you know? Whereas, but even like for me and you, um, I think like Migaku came out at a certain point and everyone was like, oh, Migaku's the best thing ever. It's like me and you still make manual cards because it's like, well, you know, if it ain't broken, I'll fix it kind of thing. Whenever I talk to some people, they're all like, Wait, what? You still you make manual cards? They're always really yeah. surprised. But I yeah. I don't know. I've always made manual cards. I don't make cards very often anymore. And right. Yeah. I did set up like an automatic card kind of thing, but it didn't. It doesn't even look like the way I want it. So I usually just do it manually because I just want it to look a specific way, and it's hard to get it to work that way. And I'd rather just make cards and not worry about it. Mm. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you about your hanky, but you probably would discuss it in like other videos. So. I probably I won't go too much, but um, do you think that there's like an end game for Anki as well? Is that like you're in your philosophy? Do you think you should just stop using it, or what are your thoughts? I don't think you should stop using Anki. I think mm. that it it doesn't actually take very much to do Anki. It's only a small yeah. amount of time every day, and you should just do it. Like I don't, I don't really. <laughs> and for me, I didn't. I never 
like some people say Anki is like this horrifying thing. Every day they dread doing Anki. Yeah. It wasn't like that for me. I was like, Anki's there, I do it. That's all that matters. So mm-hmm. I'm just going to do it every day. And that's what I do. And even now I do rep, rep my Anki every day. I add new that's cards great. occasionally. I don't have like, oh, I have to add 10 cards a day anymore like I used to. Mm-hmm. But I do rep yeah. my Anki every day. I add cards occasionally. And I have no intention of ever quitting Anki. Because the mm-hmm. point of Anki is that you don't stop and you retain the knowledge for the rest of your life. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I, I find it. <laughs> I, I My relationship with Anki has been a little bit on and off. Like I said, I deleted it for a while. But that's because I get quite obsessive about it and I get really obsessed with. I think I think the problem with me is that I get obsessed with adding too many cards rather than actually repping my stuff. So like I would add like a hundred cards in one sitting and then just not rep my deck as much because it's like, I've already done my Anki for the day. Like I get way too uh, obsessed with the adding of stuff rather than repping because the repping is too boring or whatever. I don't have, I don't want to sit down and do it. Whereas I suppose if I prioritize sitting down and doing it, then the rest would sort of take care of itself. So yeah, it's something to look into. But like I said, I, th- I think using Anki definitely has its value even for like schoolwork. So you know, if, if you want to give it up, like that's fine. I think that uh, the big argument is that, well, native speakers didn't use Anki to get fluent, so you don't need it. It's like, yeah, it's true. When they, uh, native like, speakers spent 18 years going to school in their language, yeah. all they did it was interact with their yeah. language for their whole life. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And also, like, but beyond native speakers as well, people who got really good at English, like for like the top speakers, they just read books. So it's like, well, why don't you just read books instead? Which is probably, you know, pretty much the right answer. But not, that doesn't mean that Anki doesn't help at all. It has no value, I don't think. So yeah, I, I'd agree. Probably just carrying on with Anki. If you can manage it, if it's not taking up too much of your time, then because you've got to think about the ROI as well, because if you're reading, say, an hour more of books versus doing an hour of Anki, probably the book mm-hmm. is yeah, over a long term, probably so, the book, right? So it turns out time seeking. Mm-hmm. I would never say you should do an hour of Anki. Even when you're starting out, I don't think you should do an <laughs> hour of Anki. Cause, but that, that's including adding cards, by the way. Yeah. Even yeah, adding cards, think. like I yeah. only added 10 cards a day. That doesn't take very long. And nowadays i don't i think i never spend more than 10 minutes a day repping anki i just do my wow. reviews it doesn't take a lot of time wow, and i good. finish yeah. it and that's really if good. you and the end game of anki is like once mm. you once you stop adding new cards um you don't really have a lot of reviews they just de- decrease naturally so it becomes really easy to just like less than 10 minutes a day i can just keep up my japanese knowledge just a little bit more i think it's worth it but yeah, yeah. on the opposite end, there are lots of people in the community who are like grinding Anki, like two hours of Anki. <laughs> I like do 60 cards a day and you yeah. don't need to do that. That's way overboard. The point, oh. like the the meat of the immersion oh. method is immersion. That's why it's in the yeah. middle. And 100%. so you don't, started, you don't yeah. need to do so many cards. You really only mm-hmm. need to do 10 or 15 a day. And that's that's plenty. You'll learn all the yeah. words you need. Yeah, definitely. I think there's also like a a rush to get to a certain card point. Like actually, for me personally, my goal, I always wanted to get to 10k cards before I quit Anki. I'm currently at about 8.5k, but the, actually, I restarted my deck. So I got to like 7.5k and then deleted my deck. And then I restarted like recently. So I'm around 8.5k. And I said to myself, once I get to 10k, then I won't stress about doing my Anki. Like, I'll just like leave it for a few days or whatever. Like, I don't really care. Whereas, you know, before, but there's a lot of people who are maybe like they're at 1k words, they're at 2k words, and they stress like, oh, but I need to get to 10k, so I need to be doing like 25 words a day. It's like, no, chill out. Like, you can, you, you'll get there, just it will take time. I like, have the patience, have the sort of clarity to think longer term. Because I, in my journey, I used to do 20 cards a day, and that was that was me for like a year or two. Like, I was just doing 20 cards a day because I want to get the high number. And I thought that once I get to 10k cards, then I'll be fluent. But just because you have 10k Anki cards doesn't make you fluent. You probably want 10k hours of immersion. That's what's going to make you fluent, right? So prioritize the immersion over Anki is definitely something I'd agree with. Yeah, 100%. I don't think 20 is too much. It's on the higher end, but I don't think it's yeah. too much. Um, right. Depends what you manage. Yeah. I think a lot of this comes from in the community. There's this big like race. It's like a it's like a big race of who can get the JLPT faster, who can get fluent faster, and it's not about that. Like, and everyone compares themselves. Oh, you know. Doth got the JLPT and I don't know, he got it like six, nine months, something like that. OG man got the JLPT and one in nine months. I have to do that too. I have to get this. You know, it's this big race to the finish line. 
but language learning is not a race. And um, when you when you're racing and you're doing so many cards a day and you're now if you're doing lots of immersion a day, that's great. But if you're trying to grind Anki many hours a day because you're just trying to get your card number up, you're tr- you think that'll get you fluent faster. Well, you may get fluent faster, like you may know more faster, but there's a difference, in my opinion, between the quality of someone who does it slowly, takes their time, spends lots of time immersing versus the quality of the like the language model someone has in their brain who rushes through it and does tons of they input massive amounts of information each day. I think it's going to be harder to acquire the nuance of every word and to to get natural acquisition of each word because it's takes a long time and you can't really rush it if you're if you're trying to get to a high level it's going to take time and yeah something you said there actually made me think of something is that i recently just as a part of like general self-improvement it's like i've been trying to watch less youtube and sort of tv this sort of thing like it's sort of instant pleasure sort of stuff and rather focus on books and audiobooks because they're longer form and i found that if i focus on one idea so let's say i read a book on social skills i focus on one idea for like hours at a time my brain acquires the idea and the language associated with it much better than if I watch like a 10 minute YouTube video there, 10 minute YouTube video here, 10 minute like all the different domains, right? So I think actually focusing in on your domain can actually be beneficial. Like you say, don't try to rush it. It's definitely a good, good bit of advice to, for sure. Yeah. I, de- I definitely think there's a big difference in the quality of acquisition between someone who tries to rush and cram knowledge versus someone yeah. who naturally um, acquires the language over time. Definitely, definitely. It's, it's all about the long term thinking, having a long term plan. I'd say, just yeah. And I, I think with Japanese learners, there's a huge emphasis on co- comparison. Like, oh, he got JLT, he did this, he did that. Because because the Japanese learning community is so big, they have that. Whereas for me, I didn't have anyone to compare to. Like, I was just it was just me versus me the whole time. So I've never really had that problem. So that's that's the plus of learning a perhaps less popular language. <laughs> the community is really big and it's highly competitive, and a lot of people mm-hmm. make learning Japanese their sole identity. So it hurts their pride if someone's better than them in a shorter amount of time. But everyone learns differently. People have different native languages. I mean, even the same person doing the exact same thing is going to learn different because people's brains are different. So you can't you can't compare yourself so much to people. Now, obviously, if you're taking like many, many years and you're not and something's wrong. But if within the time span we're talking about, it's not worth it. You just take your yeah. own time and get good on your own. Yeah, exactly. And I think I think it's funny you touched on the language thing. Because we so you're at your level of Japanese, I'm at my level of Korean. I think if either one of us tried to learn Korean or Japanese, would do you reckon we would learn it faster? What, I think what do you we think? would learn it very fast actually, because it's so yeah. similar. Yeah. So it is tempting actually. Like after thinking about that, it's like, well, why why don't I try and get Japanese? It's like it's almost free, right? It's like I can get it real quick. So yeah, I've yeah, the same the temptation. Thing. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think but with Korean, it's it's hard to it doesn't have a huge selling point. Um, it, it does it, it does more so now, but like Jap- the the selling point of Japanese is huge, like anime and like the the, the culture surrounding it is huge. Whereas Korean culture is like it's a little bit more niche. So yeah, there is that. Okay, so on that um, line of thinking, you mentioned some there there are some people you know who were doing Korean immersions, fluent in Korean. So tell us about those kind of people and you you mentioned that guy who you said was always speaking korean tell, uh, us, a, tell us a story about him yes yes okay so i'll start you through like in front of the logical order of people i met and then people like how that developed so the first person i met was someone in the community called adam Ola. Uh, that's his actual name um he i met him through i think the refold server about a year and a half or like two yeah about a year and a half into korean and um we, you know, hit it off. He was learning Korean, I was learning Korean, and he would be like my sort of accountability partner almost for the immersion journey. So like maybe once a week or so, we would have a call and we would, you know, talk about our progress. He would share like his Migaku stuff or whatever he was doing, you know, we'd be sharing language and stuff. It was great. Um, and then about two and a half years in, he started to take it a little bit less seriously or he, he said he, he was less focused on Korean for now. Like he, he got to a decent level and he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of chilling, right? Whereas I, 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 I kind of, I did stop a little bit with him, but there was something in my mind that I still wanted to get better. Like I was at that two year mark and I was like, well, okay, I could take the foot off a gas a little bit, but I still want to get better longer time. So I kept on through and we did it. We actually did a podcast. So some people who know my channel will also see that we had made like a Korean voice podcast. So 
we talked about sort of the essential tools, the basics from going from zero to like not 100, but zero to maybe 18 career, right? Um, so that was that. And me and him eventually we didn't fall out, but we kind of lost lost uh, contact. Like he stopped contacting me, and well, not stopped contacting me, but he contacted me less. And it, it's not it's nothing against him. He's just in a different frame of life. Like our goals kind of got a little bit more different. So that was him. But I had some really good times with that guy, and um, yeah, he came to Korea. You know, he met up with me. Like he, he stayed over at my place. Like it was, it was really good uh, time. So I, I really thankful and really grateful to have met that person. Um, no, I'm not sure how, how our relationship is going to go in the future, but yeah, that was very interesting. And then uh, within the, one of the, the servers, so this the guy, Adamola, invited me to another server, which was a Korean guy who teaches English, and his name is Jongin. And Jongin is just some, some random guy who found out about emotional learning, God knows how. And he, he actually did emotional learning for like 2,000 hours, and then he said that, oh, but actually, I don't think emotion really works, like, because his English wasn't actually that good. So he's kind of done immersion learning, but said it doesn't work. So now he kind of promotes some weird like alternative methods, but I'm not really sure to be honest. Basically, he's not like a fake guru, but he, he teaches English, but he's not really um, of a high level, so I'm not really sure. But yeah, I, I spoke to him. Then outside of that, there was someone else called Ian, who's the guy who lives in Busan in the Kyeongsang so I mentioned him earlier in the podcast that there's someone in, who lives in Busan. And he, he speaks the Gongsan Do Saturday, he knows the pitch accent and all of this. And he said he acquired Korean via pitch or via just listening and being in the environment without any Anki. So he didn't do any Anki, he just immersed. And now he speaks really good Korean. Like he actually speaks with the pitch accent as well. So I've noticed when he talks, what would happen is in a group, so there'd be people from Seoul and people from like Busan or other areas. And even though I'm a foreigner from the Seoul group, he's a foreigner in the Busan group, he doesn't get alienated as a foreigner because he speaks with the, the dialect. So it's almost like he's one of us, like, oh, you're, you're not from Seoul, so you're one of us. So the, the, the tribe, tribal sort of identity um, is quite strong. So that, that's actually a really big bonus for anyone who wants to learn like a dialect, especially in Korea, is although you get judged by people who are from Seoul, if you're in your own sort of native town or in the, sorry, in the local town, people will accept you more as part of the tribe, which is quite nice. Um, and then finally, there's this one guy called John. Uh, this guy called John or Chunsin on Korean YouTube. Same is like short for Chunsin name, which means teacher. Uh, but yeah, he teaches Korean people English. And this guy, he, I, how did I find out about him? I found out about him through Discord. I think he was in one of the Korean communities, but he is just like the ultimate Sigma male. Like he just does his own thing. <laughs> I've only ever spoken to him in Korean, by the way. So this is like really weird. Like most people who learn Korean to a high level will still speak to me in English because like, you know, why not? Whereas this guy, it was like Korean only from day one. doesn't give a crap. Like I tried to speak to him in English. I was like, are you sure we don't want to speak in English? It'll be much easier. He's like, no, no, no. Like, hang on, I said, do it in Korean. Uh, so, but, <laughs> Dude, that guy's a beast. Yeah, he's actually like next level age. At birth. I, I met up with him and we filmed like some Korean content. Like I filmed like a little podcast with him and he said all this. But he's got like 80K subs on YouTube. Like he's really popping off on, on the Korean scene. Like I might have to link him or something. <laughs> but... Yeah, he's, he's such a piece. And we went to, he was in Seoul one time, so I met up with him. And we went to like an English language exchange. And the whole time, he was just like Korean only mode. He's like such a piece. <laughs> like, even I curved, like, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, now I'll do it. I'll do the Korean only thing. And then even like I curved, like, okay, I'll speak English because mm -hmm. this is going terribly. Whereas he was like, no, Asia, like, <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> That's awesome. All Korean. So, yeah, he's pretty just. See, I'd, love, I'd love to talk to him, but I don't speak Korean. So, I think I'd yeah. love to talk to him. <laughs> So I want to go into like the, the final part of this interview and I want to talk about what is the age at end game where, why are we doing age at and is learning Japanese or Korean, the point of life? What is, what other things can we take away? What else, what else can we learn from age at other oh, than, you. than Japanese? That's probably the best question you've asked. Um, wow. This is like philosophical. Um, so when I first learned Korean, I thought it would sort my life. You know, I thought I'd just go to Korea, forget about where I came from, forget about all of my struggles, and just go and be that guy who lives in Korea and just like has an awesome life. The reality is, it doesn't matter where you live, just because you speak a bit of the language, it's not really going to change your life in terms of leveling up your position in society. If that it, will, it will help if you live in you know, a foreign country and you now know the language and now communicate with the locals. Yes, that's awesome. But if you're learning Japanese or Korean or whatever, just 
to stay in your mom's basement and never use it or never make any friends, then I think it's almost a waste of time. And I, it's not a waste of time because you can't really truly waste your time if you, if you want to bring the argument. But if, if you're someone who sees life as something where you can level up and you can achieve better states of experience and better states of life, then learning languages is probably, it's not the shortcut. <laughs> you know, it's, why, why are we doing this? Uh, it's, it's I think not, why I'm doing it. Sorry? Well, I was just going to say, it's not a shortcut to fix your life. If your life is yeah. messed up, it's still going to be messed up when you learn Japanese. 100%. That's the harsh reality, which people only learn you know, a few years in, like myself, like a few years in, I was like, oh, this isn't really that cool. Like I got cool, I got good at Korean, you know, I could speak to Korean people, but like, that's it, you know, it doesn't really get much deeper than that. I'm sure, you know, maybe you find like the love of your life and all that, like great, good for you, you know, Merry Christmas, but you could do that in English as well, right? It's not limited. Um, so why are we still doing this? I am doing it just because there's something I discovered it's because it's a new idea. It's an idea that is not well known. Like there's, there's people who learn languages and there's people who learn languages through immersion. And with the immersion learning community, like the people who actually make it are pretty like, you know, some far between, like maybe Japanese community has more, I don't really know, but the people who actually make it aren't that many, right? And I just have the passion for learning the language. I think you have to just love it for what it is. Like you can't expect it to make your life better. And it's a huge time investment, so you really have to love it. But you can't just be like, oh, I kind of want to learn Japanese, or I kind of want to learn this language. Like, you have to really want to do it for it to be worth your time, for it to actually be meaningful to you. So the reason I'm doing it is because it's meaningful to me still. Uh, I'm actually going to take the foot off the gas, you know, in following years. Like, right now, I'm in Korean University, and, you know, it's probably the best time for me to get good at Korean. But, you know, let's say a few years pass, I'm probably not going to stress out of, like, did I get my four hours of reading in a day, you know? I'm probably going to ease off the gas, and my interest will go to other areas of life. Like, you can't just expect to get a good language learning and that to solve all your problems. Like you still probably want to take off, take care of your, like, you know, your fitness, your just general education, maybe things like meditation, you know, good things, good habits, right? Um, but in terms of my philosophy of like, what, not the not meaning of life, but um, in terms of saying like, oh, that's a waste of time, it's a waste of time. I think it's hard to really clarify that learning a language is a waste of time you can't really say that outright but the value that it brings is only is very limited compared to other pursuits is what i'm saying so i really highly recommend you don't do one thing or if you are going to focus on a learn language make sure you have a goal that you're going to reach and then once you reach that goal you can like sort of branch out a bit because being that guy who's like really good japanese but does nothing else for his time is i, I wouldn't say it's a waste of potential here yeah, yeah. I've, I've taken my foot off the gas recent years because um, I'm, I've been focusing on like what I'm learning in university. I'm doing computer science and career. Mm. What am I going to do with my life, my career and stuff yeah. like that? Yeah. Um, of course, I still study Japanese all the time. I speak in Japanese, but um, yeah. it's, it's, not like, it's not like this autistic grind for like <laughs> oh, my four hours of immersion a day. I don't yeah. really think about that anymore. I just do my mm. life in whatever language I want. Um, yeah yeah that's the best place to be because that was the that was the original goal for like most people it's like just be bilingual right just each other i, I want to i just want to ask you something i don't know how much reading or learning you do in japanese but how do you find your like your knowledge transfer so at least for me when i read something in korean i feel like it's a little bit slower for me to understand but i feel like the ideas eventually once i get to them like they can somewhat transfer but there's there's like of delay i don't know how you feel about learning new concepts in i i i'm i feel the same way i think it's much more difficult for me to learn a new concept in japanese most cases um and i also don't have a lot of experience doing academic study in japanese so i'm not used to it if i read textbooks more i would get used to it. i'm sure it'd be better but um i've never really done any academic study in japanese except i mean the occasional like self-improvement stuff and um, not, not like hard sciences or like things where they have an objective answer, math, you know, science programming. I haven't done any of that in Japanese, but, um, I, I do find that it's much more difficult for me to learn something in Japanese than it would be in my native language. 
If I already know it in my native language, though, it's easy to transfer that knowledge. You just immerse with some of the content. Like, for example, uh, I used to work as a professional repair technician for electronics, and I, um, my boss didn't want me to immerse at work, but he said if it was related to the job, I could watch it. So I would watch repair videos in Japanese, and then I was able to learn how, it was, how to talk about it in Japanese relatively easy. But if it's something I don't know anything about, learning for the first time in Japanese and it's like something relatively complicated, like a science, I, it will be much more difficult for me to learn it in Japanese. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I've been finding because I'm at university, right? I'm taking lectures in Korean all the time and I'm learning new things. And I've, I've taken this class, which is logic and critical thinking, which you have to take in Korean. It's a Korean class. Um, and I found I've been learning these new things. So I've been learning what a deductive argument and inductive argument is. Uh, and I find that because I'm learning it in Korean, it's like just that little bit slower. And it's like, ah, oh, I, I got so good at Korean just for this, like just for like a worse level of English. It's like, wow, like, <laughs> I probably could have just learned this all in English. Like, I mean, it's nothing stopping me from learning in English now, except I have to be in this class, right, which is in Korean. So, yeah, it does make you think because there's part of my brain which is like, well, what if I just get really, really good and then I'll have no barrier between learning. But it's like, will that day ever come? I don't, I don't I'm not sure if it will. When it, comes, be when it comes to me, I yeah. almost always learn things in English. Even like even if I could do it in Japanese, I usually do it in English. My school is in English, obviously, because I'm going to school in the United States. But I don't really learn anything in Japanese. Um, I, I'm even like if I'm trying to troubleshoot a program or something, I always look it up in English just because it's easier, and I don't really bother with doing it in Japanese. Yeah, yeah, that's, that makes sense. I just, I'm really curious, one thing I've been really curious about is just the science of this, you know, learning in another language, like learning through the means of a foreign language, because technically speaking, it should only be your linguistic ability. So for example, let's say, like for example, democracy, you probably know what democracy is in English, right? You know how the concept works. But if, if you, if I asked you to explain it in Korean or in Japanese, you might not be able to explain it just because of the linguistic difference, but the knowledge is still there, right? You still know what it is, right? Um, whereas when you learn something to new knowledge, because of like the linguistic barrier almost, it's like it, you don't get to grab as much of the knowledge. Is, is, that's my sort of theory. Um, so in, in which case, it's like if you increase your sort of linguistic skills, will you eventually be able to grasp more of the knowledge perhaps? But will it ever be as much as your native language that, that I don't know? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think so. I, I want to say that it's possible, but I don't know. But I feel like like people who have been living in the United States, who went to college in the United States and have worked here for like so many tens of years, but are were originally from another country. I mean, there's people that have done all of their learning in English, and I feel like they were able to do it fine. So it should be possible. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's what that's what sort of plays in my mind. But, I think but, a part of it is because hmm. our native language is English and it's so convenient. It's really yeah, easy to rely problem. it's really easy to rely on English, but these other people they have no choice cuz their native language sucks. They were you know, yeah, they, yeah. they spawned on the wrong part of the map to get the information. <laughs> so they they really need to do it in English. Exactly. I think that's the thing cuz the English content and the amount of resources available in is so huge. It's like it almost makes it easier just to do it in English anyway. Yeah. 100%. Even in my university lectures, they refer to materials that originate in English. Like they have like some translated stuff, or the, the professor will say, I read this English book. It's like, wow, <laughs> English really is the answer. <laughs> it is. It's, it's true. Yeah. So that's that's kind of depressing. Of, of, of like, <laughs> I, spent, <laughs> I spent years learning this language, and you're telling me that actually the best language is English all along. Yeah, exactly. That really is. That's the red pill. There you go. Yeah. yeah. The black pill. Yeah, black pill. <laughs> that's even, the yeah, black whatever. Pill. Uh, what skills do you think you learned from AJAT that helped you in other pursuits in your life? Like for me, I think that AJAT, AJAT taught me discipline. And, you know, because I did AJAT, it transformed me from a person who did nothing with my time and played video games to someone who was interested in be, being productive, making money, you know, trying to improve my life and the quality of my life. So how do you feel about that? Yeah, I can relate 100%. I, I'm not sure if it's made me more productive but it, it sort of instilled the image that i can achieve goals so like i can succeed now i am a successful person because i've succeeded at this one thing 
Like, for example, there are people who go through life who just don't have anything. Like, they get to 25, let's say, and they're still, you know, just playing video games and not really, haven't, haven't got any achievement, right? Whereas, at least, even though it's not, it wasn't necessarily hard work, it's like we just kind of sat on our ass all day and watched TV, <laughs> but it was in another language and there was some level of dedication to it, right? I mean, compared, can, compared yeah. to, like, what most people do, it takes an absurd amount of discipline to do that. Yeah, I suppose it's a men- it's more of a mental game than physical. Yeah, maybe maybe I'm getting it. Yeah, I suppose because you don't physically burn out, but you do mentally. So I suppose there is that. But yeah, anyway, it creates the image of I'm someone who can do things over a long period of time if I stay focused on my my sort of task. And I'm honestly really really grateful that I found like the age app stuff, but also implemented it because there's a lot of people who know about it but don't actually do it. And like being someone who went through age app, it's really just. It was a life-changing experience in that manner, 100%. So, yeah, it makes you more productive. It makes you more disciplined. It makes you like yourself more because you, you stop seeing yourself as, like, a loser who doesn't do anything. It's like, at least I got this going for me. And now I can branch out, right? So I think the the time, or the, this time that we're in right now, we're, like, a couple of years in, we're fluent. It's like, now is the time to probably branch out and pursue other pursuits, knowing that we can, kind of thing. Because I think if you get stuck here, we just got stuck on learning languages for the rest of our life. I think the sort of return on investment is really not where it's at. Uh, so yeah, pursuing other things is, is probably the way to go. But yeah, Ajax definitely is life changing. But I would I recommend it to someone who is like, I don't know what to do in my life. Should I learn language? Probably no. Like it, it, if you're if you're someone asking like, should I learn language? And you probably shouldn't. Like you, you you kind of have to know this is what I want for sure, right? So if you're if you're coming to me saying I don't really want to learn language, I have to. Then Ajax, yeah, go for it. But if you're like, mm, I don't know, maybe should I learn this language? Nah, probably you're probably better off just stick with English and just pursuing more beneficial pursuits. Mm. That's true. And I, I feel very similar. It gave me an experience of succeeding at something. So then I felt like I'm ready to, you know, tackle other things in my life. Um like if I if I hadn't, you know, learned Japanese, I would have I would have never improved my social skills. I wouldn't have succeeded in my career. Um, I wouldn't, you know, be doing well in school like I am now, you know, because of, because of that, it gave me the motivation and, you know, what you said, like this image of myself, self image that I am yeah. someone who succeeds. Mm, yeah. It, it, it does make you into a winner, even though <laughs> it's like the, not the society's definition of a winner per se, but like, do you know, you've achieved something. Right? Yeah. So that's what I just watched anime all day. <laughs> <laughs> but you're winning. <laughs> flexing on these normies who are just monolingual. <laughs> and this is another random question, but do you feel like doing YouTube, making YouTube videos um, helped you with anything? Like for me, I think it improved my speaking skills. I think what it helped me with was trying to help me like figure myself out. Like who the hell am I? Like I make content. I think you, if people who've seen my channel, it's like my content is all over the place, but I made some like short films one time, street interviews another time. Career learning videos, like I really am still figuring out who I am or who I'm becoming, if that makes sense. So I think YouTube does help you look back and go, oh, like two years ago I made a video about this, and one year ago I made a video about this. I think for for your channel, you're very much, you know, you've got your niche, you're making language and videos, which is great. I really enjoy it. And whereas for me, I haven't really nailed down who I am or who I'm becoming because I don't really like to say, oh, I'm the guy that learned Korean and that's who I'm going to be for the rest of my life. It's like, well. That was a period of my life, but then I evolved and did this other thing, right? So, but I know that the actual, <laughs> the way to get good on YouTube is, or grow on YouTube is to have a niche and target it and do all that. So I've only found benefits in terms of, yeah, there's practical levels of, okay, I got better at taking pictures and filming videos and editing and all that. But there's also the benefit of, okay, I, I now, it, it serves as a record for me. Um, but yeah, going forward, I don't really know how I'm going to, make my content i think i will talk about language learning because why not you know something i've done someone i've seen that but i do want to take it to you know other levels that's just me and my life generally like i want to pursue different pursuits now that i've gotten decent at my language okay that makes sense yeah yeah, yeah all right yeah. i think that's all the questions i have to ask thank you for oh, coming okay. on this podcast yeah. today i had a great time Thanks talking to you podcast Internet. yeah it's not really a podcast, yeah yeah but thank you for coming on my channel today i had a great time talking to you and I encourage everyone to check out his channel in the description and any other, you know, links and channels are probably going to put down there. So thank you so much for watching guys.